I want to tell you something that will help me feel closer to you. And I'm pretty nervous to share this with you. So I really don't want you to feel obligated. But I've been noticing that it would really feel meaningful to me if we would have more sex or focus more on our physical connection with each other, even if it's not sex. Like I've I really would love to feel reconnected to you in that way. Mm. Um, and like, I feel my heart racing right now because it's just like such an uncomfortable thing to talk about. But I want to talk about it with you because I love you. Well, Janelle, welcome um, to Feeling Free. We had an amazing time in our membership group, the Freedom School. So I knew, and I believe you knew, that we had to come back for a podcast. So thank you for being here. Definitely. I'm so excited to talk to you. I've been literally <laughs> looking forward to it for a few days. Like, oh, we're going to have a juicy, awesome conversation about <laughs> facing fear and shame and sex and love. It's my favorite subject. <laughs> yeah. like, And like, I'm so happy you you reached out to me because we really are aligned. Like, you know, it is in a different um, or subtopic, I guess, but it, yeah. like it really is aligned. And it's so, yeah, like I've been looking forward to this too because uh, just like I love the way you communicate and you give simple, practical, straightforward ways to communicate within love and sex. Um, and that's like, and it's so needed, you know, it, it, like it's so needed. Like there's no reason to get complicated. Yeah, totally. I wish that we in schools learned interpersonal communication, especially yes. interpersonal communication around intimacy. Um, so yeah, that's really? part of my, my mission. Just like help people let go of it needing to be perfect. Like a lot of people have been commenting like, oh, but it's just so awkward when it's like kind of scripted like this. It's like, yeah, yeah. first, but then it becomes emotional muscle memory and it yes. feels less uncomfortable. Yeah. And like, I want to, and go back to the school thing. Like, yeah, I really thought that about, um, cause we had like awesome engagement when you and I, like when you were teaching and just like doing Q and A, like in the freedom school. And like, again, like we're aligned with that as like, this is literally like how I want, like if I were to run a school, what would I teach like once a week? You know, like actually like real, of course you learn things, but it, it's definitely outdated. So I want to start totally. this off by giving you, um, I mean, you already have um, clout, I guess is what I'll say, but I want to read some comments from TikTok because that's where you and I have both been excelling um, and especially like you like you're so consistent which is really impressive thank you um, so one comment I want to read your account has brought my negative self-talk down so much I've questioned myself my whole life but you have validated my feelings in 15 seconds you did that I love that right that's so dope and then you're amazing and helping me be more confident, which is making my marriage healthier. Thank you. Hearts, 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 hearts. Your, your videos bring me to tears sometimes because relationships are hard in all caps and your word just makes so much sense. <laughs> Thank you so much. This shifted my perspective and helped me heal from a relationship that ended years ago that I didn't realize I viewed as a failure. Boom. Mm, totally. Yeah. yeah, that's totally. so dope. So um yeah back to the even just like with the tiktok thing is that is mostly like a younger audience and it's so cool that everything's so accessible but anyway let's <laughs> we'll get we'll get juicy like why are we afraid to communicate honestly i think there's a ton of shame around what we really want and need regardless of even if it's about sexuality or relationships right we live in a we live in a culture where we're taught, you know, we should, we should sacrifice our happiness for the greater good. I mean, that's more the case in other cultures, but it's also the case in, um, you know, puritanical culture. It's like you should sacrifice your well-being for God. Um, 
And I do think there's a way that you need to compromise and collaborate with other human beings, right? Like we're not cowboys who are just like living by ourselves, doing whatever the heck we want, but there's some kind of a balance where mm. you feel, you feel your commitments and, you know, in some cases, maybe obligations to the people in your life, but you don't let shame hide who you really are. So I just feel like because of the lack of knowing how to balance the give and take of being yourself and being cooperative with other human beings, that is at the root of a lot of shame. Yeah. And why, like for you, your works, um, you know, like what is a common, I guess, yeah, like what's a common, um, what are common ways that fear and shame sabotage us? in our sex and love lives like totally like what's the what are some ways that you've seen to be most common the most common things are a you consistently do things that you really don't want to do just mm. to maintain a relationship um and then you are resentful of it because yeah. you're not establishing your own boundaries and the flip side of that is consistently shutting down your own needs because you're so terrified of seeing your partner uncomfortable or upset <laughs> that you take it personally and you think, oh my God, I have to turn off my desires or my needs. Um, I'm a bad person. I, I should not. E I should never make my partner uncomfortable. And the truth of the matter is, is that relationships are uncomfortable inherently. Intimacy is awkward and uncomfortable. And that's real yeah. and that's how we grow. So letting go of the myth that it's our job to protect our partners from any discomfort by shutting down our own needs. Oh, that's so good. And <laughs> yeah, like it is. And that's me. Yeah. Like I want to tackle both of those. We'll go to the second first because um, yeah. that's what I relate to. And this is yeah. all about me. Just kidding. Um, like I relate to that one a lot too. <laughs> like totally. for me, I'm definitely just like a giver. I'm like, I want to be the best and most significant partner you've ever had. And I'm going to totally like, like do all these things and you're going to love it, you know? And then yeah. like what you said, like, you know, I can imagine even being a parent one day, like it's so uncomfortable for me to watch people struggle or feel uncomfortable or grow. And like, but that's the whole point of growth. So I love how you just, that is like a myth. And you also talk about disappointment right? Of how like, it's going to happen no matter what. Absolutely. Absolutely. We need to get more comfortable mm -hmm. with disappointment in our sex lives, in our relationships. Yeah. And part of that, again, is the balance. Like you're not going to get everything you want from your partner. You're not going to get everything you dream of for your sex life. But if you're just really clear about what you want, you are going to get some of it. And there's no need to shame each other for what we want. And part of why we do that is because we're so terrified that we have to be everything for each mm -hmm. other and we have to fulfill all of each other's needs that when our partner has a need we can't quite fulfill or a desire that isn't part of our desire story, we get threatened, we get triggered because we think it is my obligation to be perfect for you and because I am not, this is wrong, you are bad, I am bad. <laughs> we need to let go of that, those stories. They're not serving us. I love that. So what, what is the balance in that, like the balancing act of n like not settling and then also being disappointed? Like, what is that? What is that fine line? Right. I mean, I think it looks differently for everyone, mm -hmm. but I feel like all of, all of life is, is a kind of a, a, you know, a sine curve of sometimes things feel really great. And sometimes things feel really hard. You know, there's a mix of compromising and processing and disappointment and fun and joy and elation and connection. And it really, you know, it just depends on each person and like what they really need and what they're willing to sacrifice in their relationships. But just really keeping in mind that like some days are crappy and some days are super mm. connective and that's both, they're both normal and you need to have both in order for the other to exist. Yeah. How do you think, um, do you think that our in like deep down, I believe that we do. I would love to hear your thoughts. Like we know, like we might not like, like the answer, but of the point of like, okay, they don't meet my values or hit on my 
boxes or like they're not meeting me, like they're not like putting in that work. Um, but from your own experience, like I'm just, does our intuition know like how do we, it is different for everyone. So do you advise people to listen to their intuition, intuition or how do people know of like, okay, I'm not getting what I deserve versus this is just day-to-day -day disappointment? Yeah, I think you start by sitting with the uncomfortable feelings and taking some time by yourself or if you're someone who processes with people to talk to a therapist or a mm. best friend, but taking space away from processing it with your partner at first, just because there's a lot of, um, there's just a lot of trigger that comes with having a deep attachment with someone. You need some space away from that to think about it. And I think just being with the discomfort, meaning just taking deep breaths, noticing the, the uncomfortable feelings or the sadness and really excavating it. Just instead of trying to make it go away, really asking it, what can I learn from you? Why are you here? You know, I, I have this metaphor that I learned from my very first life coach, mm -hmm. that there are saboteurs that you can almost imagine like a, a little guy in a trench coat who's coming into your mind or into your heart or into your life. Um, and you could see him or it or they as a, an intruder, as someone to destroy, as something to go, you just want them to go away. Or you can sit down and have a meal with them and take, take some time to say, I see you, you're here. Like, tell me what I need to know from you. And then you can politely invite them to leave your mind or your heart. So it's really taking time to feel your feelings, which sucks. It's super uncomfortable. I mean, I hate doing it. I know it's like, we yeah. all hate doing it, but that's really part of your own self-assessment of, am I okay with this level of disappointment or is like, are, are my values like fundamentally not being met? That inquiry is different for every person. You know I mean? Mm -hmm. Some people might think, um, I have to be in a relationship where I am, um, you know, having, having sex with my partner every day. Like if I don't get that, I will like wither and die. Um, you know, and a lot of people probably don't feel that way and are okay to compromise, but some people do. And we need to not judge each other yeah. for our differences. And it's very, very painful if you and your partner are different in these major ways where you both feel just like that is not me. And you know, that may lead to the relationship shifting into a new form where you're no longer, you know, primary, like par co-life partners. And that's mm -hmm. super painful, but it's better to be real about what we can actually sacrifice and, and what we can't. Yeah. Where do you like personally still feel fear or shame in this realm? Yeah, I mean, everywhere. I grew up going, yeah, I grew up going to Catholic school and just like feel really embarrassed about what like certain, you know, elders in my life are going to think about the work that I'm doing. And you still feel I, that today? Yeah, like yesterday I, I posted a, a TikTok video about, um, hey guys, if there's one thing I really want men to know, it's like when you're touching a woman, don't go straight for the clit. And mm. after posting that, I went for a run and had this like intense shame reaction, which here's oh, what it really? felt like in my body, hotness in my face, jitteriness in my stomach, storying in my head, like, oh my God, was that inappropriate? <laughs> like, blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, hey, Janelle, you know, I see you have this discomfort and I that discomfort is from many, many years of like cultural, you know, social messaging that anything having to do with sexuality or, you know, anatomical body parts that are related to pleasure mm -hmm. is is inappropriate or wrong but actually like this is part of your mission is to like help people let go of shame around this and the only way to do that is to decolonize that shame within yourself you know so i Thank like to use the word that. yeah of course i like to use the word decolonize by the way because i think mm. there's a lot of repressive ideas about sexuality and relationships that are causing a lot of suffering in the world so yeah what does that and, mean so like what does decolonize mean? Yeah, so I mean, a colonized place is a place where, you know, a, a, um, a more, whatever, insistent, dominant culture has come in and said, nope, your way of living is wrong. Yeah. Everything you believe is wrong. Our way is right. You must all now adhere to our way. 
or we're going to kill you or punish you yeah. or, you know, we're, and we're subjugating you because we believe our way is better. So to decolonize a belief within your own mind or heart is to say, no, I am standing up to this repressive ideology about how a sex life or how a relationship is supposed to be. And I'm saying like, um, no, I'm not going to be, um, you know, saddled to, to the yoke of this idea that is literally causing me so much shame that I am suffering and I'm not living my best life. I love that. And think like, yeah, thanks for sharing that because there's no matter what, well, I'm just saying like for someone who views you, like they're definitely, I mean, you are exercising and express like courage with what you're doing. But the assumption is that you are like, oh man, she's just talking about sex and like pleasure and like libido and like all these different things that it's like easy for you but it's like the contrary you know and so I love that you talk about that is that you still feel it like yeah it's even more powerful that you totally. are exercising it because you're living it and you're live you're leading as an example thank you I really appreciate you asking and you know last time during our membership talk uh, I was talking about how one another pain, big pain point for me is that I want a lot more sexual attention yeah. than my than my partner does which is like a shameful because i'm a woman and mm -hmm. so like why should i be wanting more sex than my partner that's not how it's supposed to work or b um it makes me feel needy makes me feel desperate um and what is true is that sexuality is a place where i feel a lot of comfort and release and it's like a meditation it's like mm -hmm. church um it is like a way i rely on to feel like reconnected to my body um so that feels very vulnerable to like have that as a need um and yeah so like I definitely you know all uh, so what I do is just like we talk about it me and him you know mm -hmm. and we're just like very clear like that it's not you know he's just like it's not a rejection it's just like I don't want to you know it's like he has a lot of his own wounding around like feeling obligated that's like a mm -hmm. big pain point for him it has nothing to do with me or me not being desired or not being sexy or I'm not even trying to control him right so like I just need to hear you know babe like I totally love you you know and I desire you and um for me I just I it, it just like it can't feel like something that I have to do to like mm -hmm. take care of you or please you because then otherwise like I feel kind of lost and so for him it's like a reclaiming of a boundary so you can say a boundary to your partner while still like recognizing their need and loving them saying like, I mm. see you, I see your need and I can't meet you there to the extent that you need. I'm like, that's okay. And like, for me, it's like, yeah, that's disappointing, but that disappointment is so much better than if he was reacting from a emotionally immature place of like, Oh God, like, why do you want, need so much sex? Like it's disgusting. <laughs> yeah. It's embarrassing. I mean, like that's literally the way that a lot of us talk to our each yep. other because we don't have training about like, just acknowledging the other person's needs and not feeling obligated to do whatever it is that they, that they are, you know, desiring. So. Yeah, this is so important. Like this stuff, like yeah. I truly believe that this is truly life-changing. Like it totally. really, it really, really is. Mm -hmm. And so, and again, I love how you incorporate like real life. And so with approaching for, like, as an example, for someone who's never done this before, let's say they're in a partnership yeah. um, and they do want to communicate. So how would you communicate? Hey, like I would like to have sex every day or something to that effect. Well, I, we should role play it, right? I know. And hopefully the last time on the membership is a bit weird, but here, I got this here. I, <laughs> I'll be your partner. Here we go. And you know what? It's going to be awkward and weird. Mm -hmm. Like it's never going to be perfect. Like we're stumbling through how to talk about this stuff. Like that's okay. You know, it's better to just do it and try it than to get it perfect. Yeah. And I love that. And like, I'm a nerd. And so I, <laughs> I'm like uncomfortable or I'm comfortable with the uncomfortable in a weird way, totally. but, it, but it's still uncomfortable. Like, yeah. you know, and we'll get to more some like uncomfortable things later, but here we go. Role play. So wait, are you going to start? <laughs> you got it. So you are essentially. Oh, I'm going to say to you, I really, I'm like needing more sex, yep. but in, mm -hmm. a, in like, okay, so this is going to be my like emotionally mature as possible thing. Cool. I'm going to say, 
hey, Ben, I, I want to tell you something that will help me feel closer to you. And I'm pretty nervous to share this with you. So I really don't want you to feel obligated. But I've been noticing that it would really feel meaningful to me if we would have more sex or focus more on our physical connection with each other, even if it's not sex. Like I, I really would love to feel reconnected to you in that way. Mm. Um, and like, I feel my heart racing right now because it's just like such an uncomfortable thing to talk about, but I want to talk about it with you because I love you. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like wondering if you'll talk about this with me. Oh, I love it. <laughs> this is actually like super real. Um, yeah, like I love you, Janelle. Thank you for telling me like, like I absolutely love how vulnerable you are. And like honesty is that that means everything. And I would always want you to communicate, you know, what you're feeling, what you want, what you don't want. And I'll, so for me, and I know how scary that is. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and yeah, so what does that like, what does that look like for you? Yeah, I mean, again, I don't want you to feel obligated to mm-hmm. do anything you don't want to do. But for me, mm-hmm. even just like, uh, even if we could just like make out for a few minutes before we go to bed without like any pressure for it to go mm-hmm. further, or like if we could do some eye gazing, or you could just like caress my body, like, I don't need it to be like, we're gonna have sex, I just want to feel some like, intentional connection time around like physicality and just like to feel you know like you desire me and care about me and want to give me pleasure just like god that just makes that means so much to me damn so role play over like for me like as a physical touch um that's one of my love languages and i'm like a heavy like super like care into it so like for me i'm like oh yeah like i'll do it you know but like (laughs) But what You're is, like, give me the list. I want to do it all. <laughs> yeah, for real though. Like I'm, I'm an achiever. So I, mm-hmm. you know, like I really do want to like, oh damn. Yeah. Like here we go. You know? Totally. So what if someone, cause that act is extremely courageous to even start that conversation. It's going to be awkward. Embrace it. Totally. What if someone doesn't respond like how I responded? Yeah. So hey, let's say you were like, oh god like what are you talking about yeah. or something yeah i might be like i might i would start with an acknowledgement or i'd be like yeah i see that this isn't an easy thing to talk about like i can understand why this might be triggering for you and you know i just want to reiterate that the reason i'm talking to you about this is because i really care about you and love you and i want this to be a conversation like, i want you to be included in this too like this is not a demand i'm not telling you you did anything wrong because probably the reason why you're you're reacting like that is from your own place of fear and insecurity. Yes. So instead of being like, oh my God, I'm taking it personally. Why are you acting like that? You're such a jerk. It's like, whoa, okay. Like I see that you're having a reaction and this is about your stuff and I get it. And like, hey, I'm baby, I'm right here with you. We're on the same team. I want to love you through this. I mean, and if, and if, and if they're just like completely unwilling to have this conversation with you, I mean, frankly, I would rethink the relationship because if you're trying to have an emotionally mature conversation where you're owning your feelings and being vulnerable and your partner is not able to do that, it's not a very healthy conducive environment for you to like actually feel safe being vulnerable because you Mm -hmm. cannot be vulnerable with someone who's like completely resistant to it. It doesn't mean that they're not skilled and adept at it like you can be willing to try to have emotional connective conversations just without really knowing how to do it but mm-hmm. if your partner is like fully resistant to it like unwilling sustainable i think that makes sense and that's a converse that's a separate conversation but um uh like i love the idea again going back to just like i'm whether it's a grill junkie, just any type of obsessed with like this intention and intimacy and whatever I do. Um, I love the idea of um, weekly check-ins in relationships. And I understand that you do them. Is that correct? We don't do them weekly. We do them uh-huh. when we feel like it, but weekly is uh-huh. uh, an, a concept I got from just like John Gottman, the Gottman Institute who studied all these relationships and what really helps with longevity and he recommends doing weekly like scheduled check-ins. Um, but my partner and I are a little bit more free form about it, but we Mm -hmm. definitely do daily check-ins that aren't like the structured, like here's our list Uh. of questions, but like every single day we 
don't go to bed without being like, hey, you know, earlier I felt really missed when this happened or like, I really loved it when this happened. You know, that's just something that feels important to us. That's just like feels organic to, to wow, share. No, I love that. So that's the thing yeah. is, so weekly check-ins, um, if that works for you, daily, what works for you, you know, and you can change it, you know, you could try all of them or none of them. Um, I love there's that. A great, there's a great um, map that I've seen on Instagram, I'm sure you could look up when you look up like Gottman relationship check-ins where the Gottman Institute recommends like you should do, you know, a couple affirmations a day where you say something you love about each other. You should mm. spend like about an hour, two hours a week having a more detailed check-in. So there's like varying levels of how you can like acknowledge and check in with your partner throughout the week, right? You don't need to do like really in-depth check-ins every day. Yeah. Cause that, yeah, if it's really in depth, even for me, that'd be like, oh my gosh, like it's tiring. Not enough time and like too much emotional energy. Yeah, it's sure. not. It's like not as fun. You know, I want it to be fun, like as as connective and deep and intimate. I want to like have fun. Totally, and you know, part of you know facing your fear in relationships isn't necessarily fun, but part <laughs> of what makes a relationship really juicy is looking at what makes you both uncomfortable. And naming when you feel discomfort and just being real and vulnerable about things that feel uncomfortable because you are each other's mirrors for growth, right? Like you see so much of yourself reflected in the mirror of your relationship that is such juicy fodder for personal growth. So do you practice that? So so like when you, is it in the moment that you practice that? Like I'm uncomfortable and I, or I feel uncomfortable? Absolutely. Now I do. I mean, I used to be... (laughs) I used to not be very good at it because I was so ashamed of having needs mm. and like being vulnerable was something that like, took a lot of learning for me. Um, you know, and I think that's true for a lot of people in our culture because we're taught like you should have it all together. You should never yep. be weak. Like vulnerability is not, you know, only very recently are, is vulnerability becoming in vogue, right? Um, so it's like, this is a learned thing. And so, yeah, now at this point, um, it all starts with physical sensations in the body. So what is a really good thing to do if like you don't even really know how you're feeling but you're just like feeling like there's something somatically happening and it isn't feeling good so just be like I'm noticing my heart's really racing right now like I'm I'm having some kind of a reaction to what's happening like can can we take a break like maybe I need some space or like can we just like sit in silence and just like hold Mm -hmm. hands for a little bit like basically instead of having the discussion in the moment when you're triggered is just like I'm feeling a fear response. Here's how it is somatically showing up in my body and just naming it and then asking your partner for what you might need. Or they can suggest like, do you need, what do you need right now? Do you need some space? Do you need me to cuddle you? Do you want to have a snack? Do you want to do some breathing? So just knowing that when you're having those reactions, you don't have to act on them, meaning you don't have to like, ah, we're talking (laughs) about the thing. It's just like, okay. Here's the fear. I'm noticing mm. it. I'm just sitting with it. I'm gonna name the physical sensations I'm feeling. That can be really grounding and it's connective because instead of yelling at your partner, right? Like let's say you were like, wow, like you're, you know, the, the quarantine snacks are really showing, Janelle. Like let's say you said that to me and you're okay. my partner. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, wow, like I noticed like I that like felt like a, I felt a twinge in my gut because that really didn't feel good um and i don't even know what i need it's just like doesn't feel that that like i'm having a, a physical like pain reaction is like is like very different than me being like what the heck why would you say that that's so mm-hmm. rude but, but it, it, it was like not the most considerate you know thing to say but instead of like naming it in in the moment i can just be like wow okay i'm having a physical reaction to that and you're much more likely to have empathy for that than for me instantly going into defense and telling you how you messed up. I love this. It's like, yeah, just like, I feel like part of the shame and then add to this or, you know, do your thing. is just like, just say how you feel. Yeah. Like if we were just honest about how we felt, and I know that's everything absolutely that we say on the face of the earth is easier said than done. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm trying not to even use that phrase because to me, it just like goes without saying, but, um, like what else would you add to that? Just like say how you feel. 
say how you feel, but also I, I recommend to partners to have a discussion about this before you're in a fight, when you're not in a state of trigger, just to be like, hey, you know, I was listening to this podcast and I, or this discussion. And, you know, I learned that something that's really good to do if we're both in a state of like mm. having a fear or panic reaction or trigger is to just like name the physical sensations happening and then maybe ask each other, like, what do you need right now? Instead of continuing to have the discussion about the thing that caused the trigger or fear reaction. And I'm wondering if like, you're willing to do that with me. And they might be like, okay, well, what does that mean? It's like, okay, well, you know, like if there's a moment where I say something insensitive to you or like vice versa, um, what would it be like to just say, oh, wow, like I'm, I'm noticing I'm, you know, I'm having a physical reaction to, to what's happening and it like doesn't feel very good. And like, can we, can we take some deep breaths or can we take some space? So mm. I think, I think part of this is like partners really need to have intentional discussions about this before they're having the moment of trigger. Yeah, that's key. Totally. Um, what are like, when you look back on your journey of uh, communication, what is, what are, do you have some like key memories of like, wow, that was hella uncomfortable, but that was like a huge step for you that you just like leaned into it. I mean, one of my early memories of feeling like super shut down because of my own inability to communicate was when um, my partner and I of like 10 or 15 years ago, um, I was like, yeah, I really, I think I'm not monogamous and I would like to be able to like kiss people at parties maybe. And he was like, okay, we can try it. And then after I did it, I was like, oh, I kissed someone at a party and he freaked out. Like he had an mm. intense panic reaction. And instead of me being like, yeah, I see how like this is hard. Like, did you agree to something you didn't really want to do? Like, yeah. are you okay? Like, what do you need right now? Um, you know, instead of like being able to like really be with him, like I took it so personally and I was like, oh my God, I can never do this again. Or if I do this again, I should not tell him and I should just lie. It led to me not living in my integrity because like I would do some things without telling him because it was um because I was so mortified by like his intense physical reaction um and I think there was a way that he wasn't also like quite owning that he was saying yes to things just to be in relationship with me that he didn't really want right and so you know both of us had uh, didn't have enough life experience or training in in emotional intelligence and communication to be able to know how to really own our own feelings and say yes or no to things that were authentic and uphold our boundaries very well. But that was a significant moment where I remember feeling like, oh shit, like <laughs> he's so he's so uncomfortable. I did something wrong. This can never happen again. So I'm trying to think of a memory, like I think just with my current partner, when he's upset, I'm just like really much more able to just take a deep breath and be like, yeah, I totally see that you're upset about something I did right now. And he's also really adept at being like, I'm really angry right now, but I love you. Like I'm oh, angry and like, I'm angry and like, I need some space and, but we're going to like come back together and talk about this. Like I'm not abandoning you, but like I'm pissed. So like, I think we're both just like able to think meta a lot more and it just comes with practice. Yeah. Well, and like both can exist. I like how you said that, right? Like you can still be angry and you can still love them. You know, it's like, uh, absolutely. Something I, I think is, something I think is great is if you're having a fight with your partner, like a conflict is like actually hold hands. Like you still love each other. You're mm. just like having some hard feelings, but you know, that doesn't mean you can't love through it. Wow. That's really cool. And so what would you get when you look at, you know, old Janelle, like in that circumstance of feeling yeah. guilty in that moment? Yeah. Because for me, something I'm working on is definitely taking things less personally, whether it's in relationships, like someone not choosing me, or actually it's really like, it's even like in business too, like when someone doesn't choose me, it's technically rejection. So totally. So taking that less personally, like what would you, yeah. how would you love yourself? What would you say? Mm. I heard a great quotation called rejection is protection mm -hmm. and basically what that means is that when somebody rejects you or something in your life doesn't quite line up as you thought it would it's because that person wasn't meant to be in your life and I mean that doesn't sound like a very 
you know, that's like a more spiritual perspective or, you know, it sounds like there's, you know, there's fate or you don't have your own willpower, but I, I interpret it in a different way. I interpret it like, okay, well, um, you know, I really wanted this person or this thing and it didn't happen. And that's okay because I am making space for the people who are going to say yes. Yeah. Through, through this, like through this loss, through this lack. Well, and do you really want to be someone who doesn't choose you? Like, do you want to, do, do you want to be, be with, be with yeah. someone that doesn't choose you? Definitely not. I had a, I had a woman message me on TikTok recently and she was like, so I really want to get married to my partner and he really wants to get married to me, but he doesn't cherish me. Hmm. And I was like, damn, I'm going to cry. Cause I, I don't, I personally wouldn't want to be in a relationship where I didn't feel cherished, but if that's not a strong need for her, I support her. I want everyone to live their best life. But to me, it's like, I can't imagine not being, not being cherished. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I would like to explore that because I know there's so many people who, like for me, I can say like, like I'm not judging you for that choice and you're doing the best that you can. Yeah. However, yeah. I truly feel that you do deserve someone that cherishes you. I know it's so tough because like when, it, you know, it's kind of like we were talking about earlier, like what's the fine line of mm -hmm. like, what's the balance of, you know, what, what you really need or deserve or you know, what you're willing to let go of. And yeah, that's really hard because like I have so much bias in that case, like you should be with someone that you deserve is like my, or sorry, that cherishes you. It's like so yeah. part of my, value system and part of my story and like it's very difficult to be able to advise someone else on you know how do you have a relationship that doesn't have that I think a big part of that is just holding space to allow people to excavate that it's just like okay so like what is it so what does it mean to you to be cherished or what does it mean to you um to not be cherished like what are the values that are being met in this relationship um like actually maybe you're writing out the the things that you're you're feeling really nourished by in the relationship and the things that are feeling really like lacking or feeling hard so that you can actually see them on paper and be like oh okay yeah like this is this is acceptable for me or or not you know i think it's like really doing that excavation and that internal discovery process and that's what i really love to help clients with is like i have my own life and i'm very upfront about like who I am and like hmm. the kind of lifestyle I lead and what I believe, but I want everyone to choose the life and the love and the sex life that fits them. That is so important because there's really no right or wrong way. There's just what would make you authentically thrive. Yes. I love it. Authent authentically thrive, which I would call yeah. freedom. Definitely. Yeah. And that's why I was drawn to, to you, Ben. And that's, you know, that's why I reached out to you. I was like, Oh, freedom from fear. Like that's what I'm all about. Mm -hmm. Freedom from fear and, and love in my case. <laughs> I love it. So yeah. what are some common, like when you're working with clients of what is the most <laughs> uncomfortable thing for people to talk about or open up about? I definitely see that there's a ton of shame for men around really problematic beliefs about male sexuality and, and the male body. And I love is, it because I was going to ask about that, but I wanted to see if that was true. This is just like something that's not talked about very much and mm -hmm. it's not a very popular opinion. And in fact, like I recently did a video about, about um, stop body shaming men around talking, like joking about cock size and, and a yeah. man commented, wow, like when I try to post about this, people just tell me, like to shut up or like I'm being a yeah. misogynist or whatever. And so yeah. um, basically like a lot of the, the deep pain I see or is, is like men who feel like a, something is wrong with me because I don't want to have sex on the first date because there's so much pressure on men to like always be ready to perform and like should always want sex. Like they want to spread their seeds. Like actually yeah. that's not true. Like women mm -hmm. and men are a lot more similar in that way than then we realize, and there's been a lot of recent research that's shown that like actually th there's like humans just vary widely and it's not really based on gender in that way. Like some people want to have one night stands of all genders and some people want to like take it slow. Mm -hmm. Another big pain point I see is 
men feeling ashamed about um, their cock size because yeah. right it's like become socially taboo to body shame women but it's like we're still working we still got to work on um, how to not body shame men because men are supposed to be tough and not care about that stuff right it's like why do you have feelings like you're not you know why do you have vulnerability it's like mm, no that's not <laughs> no not how it works like stop body shaming everyone so do you um, think i like how you say that do you think it's because like yeah why do you think that is is it because we're just because we have lived in that like men rule the world you know mentality so if we talk about these things is it like hey like you've had your time replaced like where yeah. does you, something like that yeah i mean men have white men have had a lot of power more yeah. power than any other group of, of humans for for yeah. a long time now and so I think there's a there's a, a reclamation of other groups saying like, you know, hell no, like these, you know, the, the oppressive beliefs invented by like white patriarchal male society um, have have been very painful for me. And there's like kind of a retribution, yeah. but it's like, but there's still a lot of, you know, for, for me, I feel like the next step is just like, can we just stop shaming everyone? Because everyone. shame doesn't shame doesn't work to change people that doesn't work never 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 i mean like even if i had a client who was who was into um child pornography i wouldn't be like that's disgusting i'd be mm -hmm. like that's super painful and it really sucks that you desire that and you did not choose that that is something that you did not choose and like yeah you cannot do it it is not okay you cannot do it in the world but like, let's just sit here and like be with the disappointment that this is what you desire because it's not your fault. Just the same way, mm. like if you're born with a 10 inch or a two inch cock, like you didn't choose that just mm. because you want to have one night stands or you want to have a, a whole life of only like casual sex, or you want to um, not have sex on the first date and you want to like get to know someone, you know, before marrying them or whatever. Like there's just so like the breadth of human sexuality and desire is very expansive. And you cannot choose how your body is. You cannot choose what you desire or who you desire or what kind of relationship or sexuality you want. So yeah, there are some things that are literally not okay. Like it is not okay to have sex with children, but like, why would you shame that person? Like they didn't choose that. Um, but like, yeah, you, they're not gonna, it's not okay to do it. And if they do do it, then that's when like you need to take action, you know, mm -hmm. to to make sure it doesn't happen again. But like just the act of shaming another person for their fundamental desire or body or identity is, it's, it doesn't work. It wow, doesn't change people. That. Well, yeah. because like you said, yeah, like, hey, that's not an ideal thing to do, obviously. But like, if we shame them, that person will no longer open up. They might keep doing it. It will just go underground and become insidious and like yeah. yeah they're they're more likely it's more likely to become this, this like messed up problem that they're going to act on because the shame is like so expansive and enormous that they have no control over it versus just like wow i'm really sitting with my disappointment that i want this like you know socially unacceptable and like you know wrong thing mm -hmm. like have you know having sex with minors um but like i recognize that you know, I didn't choose that. And I, I'm not, I'm going to like consciously like not act on that because like, it's not okay in the, you know, and, um, that's like, it's much more manageable when you're not living from this place of like shame and hiding and yeah. fear. That's yeah. powerful. Um, I just it's had, not, you know, it's not a popular opinion. Like I guarantee that like oh, someone sure. listening, someone listening to this is going to be like, that's only to shame. And like, I'm definitely willing to have conversations about this and like, I, I'm open to hearing other perspectives, but like from what I have seen with working around sexuality, it's just like, it doesn't help people at all to like change their yeah. behavior. When I love that, like how you just said, like um, there's for sure someone listening and whoever's thinking that, let me just say like, I love you and that's okay too. Mm -hmm. Because totally. you didn't, you necessarily, you are unconsciously choosing that belief. And so let me just invite you to think, is that true? Do you want to think that way? Or is there a new way of thinking that you might not have thought about before? And is it possible for multiple things to be true at once? Like, is it possible yeah. for someone to, um, 
to for something to not be okay and to also not shame someone for that being their desire as long as they are do not act on it man i love this this is awesome so and there's also along that same line mm -hmm. there's this great i think it's from this great book um come as you are by dr emily nagoski it's about pleasure and like rethinking desire specifically like female desire but but she says in the book that she had this one client she's a sex therapist she had this client who is a man who was like horrified because he was in college and he was at a, a frat party and he saw a woman who was drugged being sexually assaulted mm -hmm. and he was horrified like so upset but yet he got an erection and he was like devastated about it the fact that he got an erection he thought that he was a bad person he thought oh, wow. something was wrong with him and she was like look you can your body will have like chemical reactions to things that are sexually relevant that doesn't mean that you are going to act on it. That doesn't mean that you cannot use your mind and that your brain's like, this is wrong. Like we, we as humans have the power of our minds to not do mm. things, right? So like, even if our body is like, let's say, you know, in that, the case of um, the someone who wants to like have sex with minors, like you're having a physical reaction and that is something you cannot control, but you can control doing it. You have this like amazing, powerful human brain where you can be like, okay, like that is not something I am going to act on, right? And so I thought like her unpacking that was just like really refreshing because it was just like, yeah, like don't be in shame about it. Like you're not gonna do it. And like you mentally know it's not okay. But like sometimes we, you know, we have physical experiences of arousal to things that, you know, just like, like um, a lot of women have rape fantasies, okay? That doesn't mm. mean that they wanna be raped. It's like, there's something about the fantasy that helps them feel like they can just like relax and surrender versus like uh. having, you know, to a lot of women like feel like it's shameful to want sex. And so to just like receive it without it's without it being their idea, without it, like without them feeling like they don't have agency over it is a hot fantasy because it just like allows, it gives us permission to be sexual because it's wow. just happening to us. Okay. But that doesn't mean we want to be raped in real life for the women who are having rape fantasies it's just like oh that makes a lot of sense because of the cultural context and you know we want sex without seeming like sluts and so like mm. you know to be you know it's the the sexual relevancy of it is getting to just like relax and receive and enjoy sex without feeling like there's something wrong with us so there's just so much at play when understanding what humans want and what we desire and it doesn't have to be anything that happens in real life wow <laughs> that's crazy I, i've never heard that um like rape fantasy thing before mm -hmm. um but yeah like understanding the context of it like that's mm -hmm. man like yeah this this conversation really is so powerful like i did like something came to mind of like like this actually might be like a fun idea for you like i can see janelle on tv playing the shame game but instead of like it's like releasing shame, which actually that'd be kind of like a fun idea. So I'm trying to like <laughs> to think of like other ideas of like releasing shame. Like, nope, that's not bad. That's not wrong. Like, like no judgment whatsoever. Totally, totally. So what other? I'm a like, big proponent. Uh, well, I'm a big proponent of like yeah. actually using your body to release shame. So like, I think that's why people love TikTok. You know, it's like moving <laughs> your hips, moving your body. Like yeah. you can somatically release negative feelings. Um, by by doing that, you know, and that's and that's also why meditation is having such a such a resurgence um, is just because people realize that actually just like getting grounded in deep breathing and like feeling your sit bones connecting to the floor or to the chair and feeling your feet on the ground like these things mm -hmm. can really help us just like be with our feelings and you know I think like there's a lot of you know, these conversations can be really liberating, of course, like, wow, it's so nice to think I, I have permission to yes, not feel ashamed understand. about this. But like, the next step is really using your own body to help move through things. And then also, this sounds, you know, a little like maybe hippie or new agey, and I am not really either of those. But I think there's something to be said about the power of ritual, that mm. human beings really need ritual and ceremony in order to like, emotionally move through things. And so if you are feeling shame or guilt or deep grief or sadness about something that's ha that happened in sex or in relationships, 
what's some ritual that you can do to help move you through that? Like maybe you write a letter to the person who broke your heart um, and you, and then you burn it, you light it on fire. You know, maybe mm -hmm. you, um, you like, like create some kind of like a shrine or like a circle around you and you meditate about the sadness and just let yourself cry and like give yourself, you, or maybe you go for a hike by yourself and you just like let yourself feel your feelings and you sit and watch the sunset and just like take a deep breath and just say, you know, I'm doing the best I can. So like, yeah, I think there's really something to be said about that based on just like humans needing ritual and ceremony in order to move through grief and fear. Mm. Yeah. And that's powerful. Like I would love, you know, as we begin to close a little bit, I'd love to cover just some maybe myths or things to not have like a shame about. And one thing that is a heavily avoided <laughs> topic is pornography. Yeah. Um, for because there's tons of shame. Tons like, of shame. Like for me, I remember. Of course, you hide it, but I remember looking at it for the first time and just like that's probably the most guilty, at least if not one of the most guilty. I mean, and it's not like yeah, I grew up in an extremely religious household, and culture. Um, and so for me, I just remember, yeah, like you have this urge, you do it and you're curious, but then I was like, oh my God, you know, like, and it, it freaking sucks. It sucks totally. to feel that. Totally. Yeah. Porn is really complicated. Um, you know, humans are really drawn to sex and we're really drawn to, um, looking at or like reading about sexually yeah. stimulating material and um i think it can be a problem if it's getting in the way of your life like just like any addiction if you are doing something to the point where you are not maintaining functioning relationships or you are not able to fulfill your you know your responsibilities then it's a problem but i think that porn can be used in a really healthy way as just like a form of sexual expression and you know, release and, you know, ex exploration adventure just by like seeing other ways um, of having sex. You know, there, there is a lot of porn that can be really problematic too. Mm -hmm. Like it can be really, there's a lot of degrading porn. Um, like some people are into that, but um, the assumption that like, okay, well, is this how you have sex? Like you like gag a woman and like, you know, deep throat her. It's like, well, maybe she wants that. Like some women are into that, but some women aren't. So like, how do you just like have the conversations with your partner about like, do you, do you want to watch this with me? Do you want to yeah. try this thing? Or, you know, maybe you watch porn and you're just like really into this very specific kind of porn. Um, but you're not into doing it with your partner. Like I had a client who was really into small penis humiliation porn, which like, mm. I think a lot of people would not understand is like, but he thought it was really great. And, but he didn't want that with his wife. That was not something he wanted. It's like, but it was his own little world that he would do in porn, which was, which actually was great for his wife because she probably wouldn't want to do that either. Mm -hmm. um, and so he got to like experience it through, through this, you know, through this pornography world. And then she was not obligated to like, you know, fulfill that with him, which she's not obligated to fill that with him anyway, right? But it's just like he had his little this this little thing this fetish that he that helped him feel more alive and relaxed like after he would mm. look at this this porn it was just like fun for him brought him pleasure and helped him feel more alive which is like going to benefit his relationship with her because he's like feeling you know he's he's feeling more himself or more alive or more nourished because he just like watched this like fetish porn he was into so yeah. yeah it's very complicated I think it really depends on the person and on you know what kind of relationship they have with porn they making sure that people know that like porn isn't real life like it's fantasy yes I think that was the most important thing that you said um well I mean all of it's important but like for just that that distinction of yeah. that you know like it's not real like if yeah. you are looking at it it's not real yeah. And if you don't understand it, like it's not, so yeah, I just really love that distinction. And also how you said, again, it's, there's two truths can exist. It's not just like porn is bad. All people who watch it should go to hell. F you. No, I right? like, so yeah. you, cause you it's described, yeah, you've described how it has helped and how it hasn't helped. Totally. Just like I could literally go to the gym 
twice a day and just destroy my body and my relationships. You right. know, I could eat too much food, you know, or like there's just so many things that like, it's just not just, this is the Absolutely. answer. You could, you could work too much and destroy your relationships. You could drink too much and destroy relationships. So yeah, like porn definitely has the potential to be something that's a numbing agent that is distracting yep. us from our lives and the things we need to do. It's preventing us from really feeling our feelings. It's something we go to, to alleviate our pain. Um, and you know, that's okay to a certain level, just like, you know, you're stressed at the end of the day, you have a glass of wine. It's like, okay, like, yeah, it's a, it's a little coping tool. It's like a little medicine, but it's not interfering, but like mm. it can be, it can be a big problem. So, you know, I really think it's just not a black or white issue. I like that. And then for, um, as a man, I can for sure, as a heterosexual man, I can speak that, speak to, again, kind of like the achiever mentality or like, I have to please this woman to orgasm every single time. What would you say to that, you know, uh, group of me of men who may think like, I'm a failure if she doesn't totally. do X? Totally. Well, I think it's really beautiful for any partner to want their other partner to feel pleasure and to mm. want their partner to, you know, experience an orgasm is like a beautiful intention. And so much of sex is not about orgasming. And in fact, we often rush into trying to achieve orgasm yeah. um, at the expense of having just like sweet, slow connection. Um, so, you know, I would say it's another belief to like decolonize in your mind or to unlearn is that sex needs to be about orgasming. Um, I do think that giving and receiving pleasure is much more expansive than that. And it, it also mm. involves a conversation with your partner, you know, like, Maybe your partner would really love to just like have a sensual massage from you without any pressure for her to orgasm. And, you know, or maybe she's like, yeah, like it's actually really important to me to orgasm when we have sex. It's like some, you know, everyone's different. So like have a conversation with your partner about that. Like, you know, I'm curious, like, is this something that like we, we you would want to experiment with? Um, or is this something that feels like very, really, really important to you to like come every time. But like, I, I challenge a lot of my clients to um, have a week or a month or something where orgasming is not allowed. And then it just like creates all this fun yeah. sexual tension where <laughs> yeah. it's just like, oh, we're just like enjoying pleasure mm -hmm. and like connection and touch and, and like that little sense of frustration that you can't come as like, oh, sexy yeah. and hot and makes it exciting, like knowing that you're going to be able to again at the end of your like little set experiment period. So yeah. I think it's all about like knowing that there, that's not the only way and to have a conversation about it. I love it. It's just like exploring, expanding. There's not one way or there's this way some days, not this way some other days. It's like totally authenticity, baby. Totally. I want to go back really quickly to the porn mm -hmm. subject because I was thinking yes. about um, like fear with um, a lot of partners like experience, like fear and discomfort around their partner's porn yes. use. And what I want to say is, that is so real and legit and especially if your partner is using it to the point where it's like becoming a detriment to your relationship or they're not fulfilling their obligations as like a co-parent or in work but a lot of porn use actually brings up deep insecurities that i think it is our obligation to excavate and unpack and so um before jumping right into you need to change your porn habit to be mm. like, I'm noticing it's bringing up insecurities for me that I'm not beautiful enough, that I'm not important yeah. enough to you, that I don't, that you don't desire me. And for them to be like, yeah, thank you so much for telling me that. Like, what else can I, how can I help you feel more loved and supported? Like the porn is just the, the scapegoat thing that like seems like it's the crux of the issue, but often it's underlying like fears mm. and insecurities in ways that you need to be nourished more and the porn is just like representing the things that you're you're needing more of i really like it's something, that it's something I, to consider i love how you said that because it's not like hey this porn isn't the thing it's like what's underneath that what's the why and sometimes porn is the issue but sometimes it's not so just something to consider <laughs> yeah just just so everyone knows sometimes it is sometimes it's not that's the answer <laughs> for everything so we hope totally. you found clarity <laughs> in the confusion <laughs> totally <laughs> it's that's really awesome. about like um doing your own personal excavation that's really what it's all about it's like you know the answers inside of you like we're just here to say there's lots of different ways yeah see i love that and one other thing too is almost or not almost like 
how you've said, and I totally can understand this from personal experience in relationships and just like within myself of men always have to be hard. And then you said, or I, we've talked about this before that men or women like always have to be wet. It's like, and if you're not this, then you're not turned on or you're not like right. whatever right. level, you know? Right. And to address that, it is a myth that women are always wet when aroused mm -hmm. or that, or that just because they're wet, they are aroused. Um, w wetness actually has to do with hormones just as much, if not more than it has to do with arousal. Fun fact. Really? <laughs> yeah. So like hormones, cause like usually, I mean, cause like, cause usually you say like, Oh, this ha X, this happen X happens. The Y is the result but yep. like so what does that mean like can you explain like the science behind like hormonal well some women get on hormonal birth control and it makes mm. them dry um and like aging can cause dryness as well um so it's just not okay. like being wet is not necessarily a sign of anything in fact like a woman can be wet and not aroused like for instance if she um if she like saw something sexually relevant, but is not actually desiring. Mm. So like, for instance, the guy who got the erection when he saw the date rape, even though he intellectually was like, I'm not, I don't want this, it's not okay. Like his body responded. So a woman may be having some wetness in response to um, you know, a stimulus, but it's not because she's actually wanting what's happening. So like, that can be, that, that can be really confusing and, and shaming for sure. Like if a woman gets, wet while being sexually assaulted i mean it is possible uh, because it's a sexually relevant thing even though her mind is like hell no i don't want this so like yeah man. wetness is just not a good indicator of of arousal it can be but it can also not be and so a better way would be to verbally communicate like do you like this do you, what do you want more of can i try this like what what do you want um and reading woman's body language like is mm. she you know arching her back and moving towards you and you know, does she, is she like smiling and moaning, you know, and those things could be, could be faked, but like, you know, that's up to us as women. Like we should yeah. stop faking it and start being real about what we want and don't want. Cause nothing shameful about that. Like yes. I think a lot of, a lot of women and men think like, Oh, if a man doesn't just know what to do, like yep. it's shame, you know, you don't, don't tell him, don't shame him. It's like that all vulvas and vaginas are totally different. So like, we can't, we, we got to communicate with each other. There's n it's not a sign that like, they're not a good lover. It's just like, what do you like? Like, oh my God, I'm exploring this whole new world. Like, tell me, you know, and share with each other. Like no need to fake mm. it. It's like, there's nothing shameful with, with um, asking a partner for what they're, what they like and what they're into. Cause we're all so different. I love that. Like asking for what you want. It's okay. It's more than okay. Totally. Totally. And it's awkward at first, you know, going back to the whole, like, gotta let go of needing it to not be awkward yeah and that's awesome. like that's that's just that's just life <laughs> damn well you know we could keep busting myths and overcome overcoming shame but um someone's listening and i know that they want your help so where can totally. so ig tiktok um all the yeah. things your website you're killing I'm at, it i'm at love with janelle on all the platforms and Janelle is spelled Jane with an L. So J A N E L love with Janelle on TikTok, Instagram, you know, I got a Facebook, but like Facebook's dying. Like, what can we say? <laughs> and then, um, yeah, my website's lovewithjanelle.com. I also have a YouTube channel where, um, you know, I'm going to post this, uh, video version of this conversation and also just, um, make longer videos. But, you know, at the moment I would say my pride and joy is my, my 30 second TikToks um, yeah, is seriously. talking about sexuality and relationships and just helping people let go of shame and fear in their love and sex lives. Boom. I love that. <laughs> um, if someone is nervous about reaching out to you, what would you um, invite them to do or think or just like, what would you say to them? I would say, yeah, it's always nerve wracking to start a conversation with a new person. I totally get that. I always get nervous reaching out to new people too, but I really am warm and loving and would love to connect with you. And I'd love to, um, you know, you can send me a DM on, on, you know, on Instagram or, or on TikTok. And I, at this point, I have the capacity to respond to pretty much everyone who sends me a respectful message. So I'd love to hear from you. It might not be the case that I'll have the bandwidth to do that um, in the future, but at this moment. 
at this moment. I would, lo- I would love to hear from you and yeah. respond to you. <laughs> Amazing. Well, Janelle, thank you. Like this was like one of the most powerful open conversations and I know it'll be incredibly freeing. Um, what, like, when do you feel m- most free? Like when you think of your life, yeah. when do you feel m- the most freedom or the most free at peace at ease? I really like doing things that are, that help me confront fear. Like I, you know, I told you I've hiked two long distance hiking trails. So I love doing like really stimulating outdoor activities, like skiing, um, like long backpacking trips, because there's so much fear that I confront and like being like really up against my own fear and discomfort while doing a physical activity is very healing and helpful for me because it just helps me see fear is normal. Fear can be useful. It can be a sign that you need to slow down or stop or reassess the situation. And that's great. But fear can also be a saboteur and it can be based on outdated stories about who you are or what you can achieve based on your gender or, you know, based on what, you know, childhood wounding, you know, you were told you were capable of something. So I think like actually doing activities where you are um, facing your fear and discomfort and then like edging yourself through it and knowing what you're capable of. It's so healing. So like for me, I would say that's a big one or like biking too, just like really pushing my, you know, pushing myself to the limit with like mountain biking or Mm. something and like taking just enough risk that I feel like I'm learning and growing, but not enough that I'm like traumatizing myself. Yeah. Damn you. That's powerful. Well, Danelle, I appreciate you. (laughs) Thank you for I appreciate you, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I received that. Like, yeah, yeah, like I honor it's it's cool to meet just like a fellow fear warrior. I don't know, like whatever we're called, you know, that just really leans into it, really embraces it. Totally. And so I I recognize that because it isn't easy. It might be easier the more and more you do it, but we're always going to Definitely. new levels. So it still feels scary. Definitely. Like like fear's always there. So um yeah you know, thank you like also facing fear is a privilege because people yeah. who have been like systematically oppressed and people who have had like very traumatic lives like there is no emotional space to like really you know it's like the maslow's hierarchy of human needs to like really like self-actualize around like what am i afraid of is a privilege and so oh, like, yeah. i just want to i want to name that but like it's not the way everyone needs to grow in this world in this life you know but like for those of us who have the privilege to be like, okay, like I want to self-actualize through coming up against discomfort and fear. It's, it can be really useful. I love really that. Healing. I really like that actually. Yeah. Dopeness. All right. Well, thank you everyone. Have a wonderful day. We out of here. Thank you. Thank you.